Hello everybody, it's Philly Cuts with another Hump Day Haul, number 92. You know, where I get together with you guys every week and we talk about my stack of overpriced comic books that I get every week. I think I just said that twice. Anyway, I'm feeling these 2.99 DC books, man. My Hump Day Haul was a little less expensive this week and I'm appreciating it, man. I'm liking that. Perhaps DC can force the rest of the comic book heavy hitters to lower their prices from, you know, $3.99, $3.50, down to $2.99. It's a $2.99 world for everyone. All right, guys, let's get started. First, we have Batman Rebirth. And who are these two people up above Batman? Who are they? Well, we know who this guy is with the glasses, right? Commissioner Gordon. But this is Gotham. And I'm not talking about the city people. That's that guy's name. Gotham. And then we have Gotham Girl. Now, we are introduced to them. I'm not going to tell you what they do to Batman or what they do to him in this book. Because I don't want to spoil it to you. But... They do have superpowers, they do fly like Superman, and they may have some super strength. So, it'll be kind of interesting to have some heroes with some superpowers. Now, a lot of people are saying that this book, they're liking it a lot to Frank Miller's Dark Knight Returns because we are looking at questions of Batman facing his mortality. And questions Batman is facing if he's good enough and still has the right stuff to be the Cape Crusader of Gotham. Now, basically, the whole crux of this book, which is written by Tom King, by the way, who's excellent. Check out Omega Man. The crux of this book is that there is a plane, and it is going down, people. It is going down, heading into the city of Gotham. It's like missing its tail. It's on fire. It's sinking. Commissioner Gordon's going freaking crazy. I love that Batman is driving in his Batmobile, and he just hits an ejection seat, sends himself hurling up into the air like, yeah, like wicked high up into the air to the point where he makes it up to the plane, people. You gotta love that. You gotta love that. I'm appreciating the artwork of David Finch. We're getting some cool looks at the city in here. And just imagine, imagine the horror. You know, this evokes, you know, obviously images of, you know, 9 11 and stuff and the horror associated with that. So, and it's all this one scene. So, I guess it's kind of a lot of characterization. You have Duke Thomas in this, helping out Batman, as well as Alfred. You know, they're doing equations and stuff, trying to figure out how to stop this plane from crashing into Gotham, people. Can Batman do it? Can he do it? All right, that's all I'm going to say to talk about it, because I don't want to spoil it. But Gotham and Gotham Girl, what do you guys think, man? It's pretty insane, right? All right, now on to Green Lanterns, the continuing story of rookie partners. You have Simon Boz and Jessica Cruz, baby. Rookie, rookie Green Lanterns in Section 2814, where planet Earth is home. And the Red Lanterns aren't appreciating that. And this one kind of starts out like a, a real cop story. It's like the Green Lanterns kind of show up on this premises, this house, and there is a dude barricaded in there with what looks like a Red Lantern symbol, barricaded in the house and shooting at them with uh, some kind of shotgun or something. Um, they break into here. They do a little Green Lantern justice, a nice sweet looking uppercut. I think we have Samuel Roca doing the artwork here. I might have got the first name wrong. But then we see 
that there's been some kind of weird ritualistic murder in the house. And I like that the rings are announcing it in, like, you know, intergalactic space code. New alert code 603-187 on that undercover cop. But we learn a bit more about a superpower that is revealed to the Green Lanterns. Um, Simon Boz specifically. And spoiler alert, you might want to shut it off because I'm going to give it to you right here. It is known as the Emerald Sight. And if you look at this, Simon Boz is able to get visions. And it looks like we get a nice quadrant. Or I'm sorry, that's five. So we get five. A pentagon, I don't even know. A pentagon of visions, right? It seems that this power happens randomly. At least for now. Is it a power that Simon Boz is going to be able to develop? That's what I'm wondering. Um, also, we kind of learn a little bit about the intentions of the Red Lanterns, why they want to come to Earth so bad what their deal is, and Atrocious, who is the leader of the Red Lanterns, really puts some emphasis on the importance of this mission. He's got Bleas in a chokehold. Now, if you've read Red Lanterns, as I have, you know that Bleas and Atrocious do not exactly have the best history together. There was actually a point in time where Bleas tried to overtake the Red Lanterns because she seemed to be a Red Lantern that actually was able to think for herself and not just be completely run by the emotion of rage. You know, a lot of the Red Lanterns, they're just kind of mindless drones a lot of the time, purely motivated and fueled by rage. So it's interesting to see where that's going to go. Basically, Atrocious tells Bleas that the Red Lanterns are dying, that they're on the danger of extinction, and they must protect the Hell Tower. At all costs. So if this Hell Tower gets destroyed, then the Red Lanterns are... <coughs> and then that's going to affect everybody. It's going to affect everybody because you can't have that component missing from the emotional spectrum in the Green Lantern world. So that's Green Lanterns, folks. Number one. All right, and then we have another number one, Superman number one. And people are ranting and raving about this. My comic book shop guy was so happy about this issue, you know, just basically saying that it's good to have a, a comic that actually feels like Superman. I must confess, um, I haven't really read Superman until New 52, right? As I was explaining to someone who left a comment uh, on one of my videos last week or the week before, um, I only really know Superman, of course, you know, from the movies and whatnot, but in comics, I really just started reading him in New 52. So that's the Superman that I know. This is Superman from post-crisis, a.k.a. pre-New 52 Superman. It's basically an older Superman. It's a family man Superman. This is a Superman who is married to... Lois Lane, and they have a son, Jonathan, okay? I am so feeling the artwork. There he is. I am so feeling the artwork of Patrick Gleason in this issue, man. It just works, you know? It just really works, and I find it to be very unique looking. Um, so they have a son, Jonathan, who's obviously half Kryptonian, half human, He's full of a bit of angst. He's learning how to use his powers. You know, he doesn't exactly know the extent of his powers. And there's a cool scene in this where his pet cat gets taken by a bird of prey. So there it is. It gets swooped up by a bird of prey. Jonathan freaks out, of course. Tries to get his bird back, or his cat back. But he ends up kind of, you know, incinerating both of them. Now, I don't know if that's kind of like a mini solar flare power he's got going on there. Which I wonder, is that only a New 52 Superman power? I don't know. Maybe that was some kind of variation on the X-ray vision. But, yeah, it kind of devastates him emotionally. 
So it's pretty interesting that the focus is on Jonathan and the focus is on Superman having to teach Jonathan the ropes of his superpowers. And I guess what I'm reading when I was exploring this as well is that Action Comics is going to be hitting more of you know the heavy-hitting battles with Superman. And I guess Superman is going to be focusing more on this kind of characterization type stuff. But only time will tell. I guess we'll see what happens, what goes down. But I am definitely feeling the artwork, and I'm definitely feeling the story so far, and I'm certainly interested in Jonathan. So, Superman, Peter Tomasi doing the writing. Yeah! All right, I picked up Justice League number 51 just because I read Justice League number 50. Now, if you haven't read Justice League number 50, a lot, a lot of stuff goes down in it um, that concerns, you know, Rebirth. So... If you haven't read Rebirth yet, which is 80 pages for three bucks, you got to get it. Um, there's a ton of stuff that goes down in Justice League number 50 that you're going to want to read. It was basically the conclusion of the Dark Side War, uh, part 10. Um, so I was reading that, but I got to admit, I was a little lost and a little confused because that was when I just started reading Justice League. So. This basically explores Robin, as you can see in the middle here of the Justice League, uh, going on a mission with Justice League. And this actually takes place four and a half years after the Dark Side War. Um, and it's basically Robin kind of cutting his teeth with the Justice League and gaining confidence. Gaining confidence working with this crew. Um, Dan Abnett, who is all over the place for DC, in particular Aquaman, doing an excellent job revitalizing Aquaman, thank God. Um, he cuts his teeth with the Justice League, but then it's kind of teased that he may be the leader of the Justice League. And then I get to the last page, or may become the leader of the Justice League, because I get to the last page and it says, to be continued... In Titans Rebirth number one, which I think came out this week as well, uh, but I didn't get it. So I don't know. I'll read this. I'll see how it goes, see how much I'm feeling it, because I didn't really have much interest in getting Titans number one. But, you know, this may pique my curiosity here. All right. And finally, for DC, we got Len Wein's who is one of the original writers of Swamp Thing. And this concludes the miniseries, part six of six. And basically it's Swamp Thing teaming up with a crew of supernatural superheroes here. Let me see if I can get you them right here. And uh, they got to figure out a way to get Swamp Thing back home. I'll be honest with you guys, I haven't read this for a couple issues, so I'm lost. I'm not going to try to pretend what the hell is going on in here. But I do want to comment, I definitely want to comment on Kelly Jones's artwork, which is just tremendous, man. And it really sets up the atmosphere, and it kind of gives the book a real throwback, you know, to like the 70s, man. You know, like when you find an old, old comic book from that era. It really gives it that kind of feel, you know. And uh, I certainly enjoyed the first couple issues that I read. And I'm going to just sit back and relax probably tonight. And I'm going to read issues, you know, 4, 5, and 6. And enjoy the conclusion of this series, man. Fortunately, Swamp Thing is not going to be continued into Rebirth, man. So, Another new 52 casualty. Now, on to Marvel, man. On to Marvel. And as is customary, I usually only get Star Wars books. But there's a big one out this week. As you can see, Han Solo. And it is written by Marjorie Liu. Now, if you don't know who Marjorie Liu is, she has a massive hit on her hands. Or at least critically acclaimed with Monstrous. Which is awesome. Check it out if you're into... Massive fantasy and world building and politics and wizards and stuff. And talking cats with multiple tails. You're going to love that book. This, however, takes a look at Han Solo after 
the destruction of the Death Star. He's a bit on edge. He's a bit more cautious. He's kind of, you know, picking picking his missions, you know, with more care because now he knows that he has a price on his head, not only from Jabba the Hutt, but the whole freaking empire, man, after what he pulled. So he gets called into a mission. It kind of opens with him hanging out at a bar. I'm not sure. I don't think this is Mos Esli, but it's Mos Esli-esque, the cantina bar-esque. And he gets pulled into a saga where he has to enter some ancient race, which is known as the Dragon's Void. And it's a high-stakes race with the best pilots in the universe. But that's just a front. That's just a guise. He, he, by entering into this race, he's somehow going to have access to rebel spies that he needs to extract out of this region. They've gotten themselves into a pickle, and Han Solo's got to be in there to, uh, to get them out. I'm liking the artwork of Mark Brooks. Uh, the Millennium Falcon looks great. Um, and I guess also a big theme of this book is going to be kind of exploring what Han Solo gets out of, you know, helping the Rebel Alliance, right? Because he always kind of has this persona where he's kind of like in things for himself. He really doesn't do things unless he gets kind of forced into it, unless his back is up against the wall. But I guess it's going to kind of maybe take a deeper look at what his motivating forces are. And I just think deep down he's a good guy, man. You know, he's kind of got the gruff exterior, but deep down he's he's a softy, man. So I'm liking that we're going to see him paired up with Chewie, of course. We got Princess Leia in here, and uh, as we can see, the tension continues between her and Han. Nice, nice left straight there. And uh, I guess I can't wait to see what happens. Now, I'm unsure if this is a miniseries or an ongoing, uh, an ongoing series, but... If it's a mini series, it's usually five issues and it's done. But with Marjorie Liu at the helm writing this, I'm really looking forward to it. All right, and then I got another Star Wars book. We got Star Wars number 20, and it continues with the journal of Obi-Wan Kenobi. Now, interspersed in this series so far, we get issues involving stories with Ben Kenobi on Tatooine. Supposedly, Luke Skywalker found this journal. So imagine Luke is reading this and we're getting to see the pictures. The artwork on here by, oh my lord, Mike Mayhew is phenomenal, man. I love the artwork. It looks great. Um, basically, Obi-Wan Kenobi is in some trouble, man. He's roughed up some thugs. I think it was like back in issue 15 or something. He roughed up some thugs uh, of Jabba's. And Jabba was pretty pissed about it. And he decides to hire this Wookiee known as Black. And it, it, it looks like Christian. Black Christian to hunt Obi-Wan down. Um, Black Christian is pretty ruthless, man. He uh, resorts to some pretty, pretty tacky tactics by kidnapping Uncle Owen. Now, if you know anything, Uncle Owen and Ben Kenobi are not exactly on good terms. Uncle Owen uh, doesn't really like him too much. And certainly doesn't like that Luke, you know, has been asking about him. Now... We learn more about Luke in this as well. We learn that he's, you know, run away a few times. Um, we also learn a lot more about Ben Kenobi, that he's spent a lot of time alone out in the desert just meditating. He uh, talks to Banthas, even gives them names. So I'm, you know, appreciating the fleshing out of that. And look at how big Black Kristan is in relation to Ben Kenobi. Now, Ben Kenobi is trying to use a Jedi mind trick here uh, because he doesn't want to reveal that he's a Jedi. He doesn't want to whip out the lightsaber and give it away that he's a Jedi. Um, 
but apparently being out isolated in the deserts of Tatooine have weakened his powers a little bit, and the Jedi mind trick doesn't work on Black Christian. So I'm liking how they intersperse these Obi-Wan stories to kind of mix it up, man. I'm, I'm really appreciating that, and I'm digging it. So, All right, Dark Horse Comics. This is the final uh, part of the Ashley Strode exorcism story arc, and I love this freaking cover. Um, if you've been reading this story arc, you know that Ashley Strode has been sent out to this area, I believe in East Bum, you know what, in Oregon, where for years, where for decades, children have gone missing. Uh, in the last issue... Ashley Strode enters into this hoarder's house uh, where a spirit has been inhabiting there. It's of an old woman. However, this old woman um, was instrumental in the case of these missing children because back in the day, her father, when she was a little girl, her father used her to lure children back to their house to play and then, you know, they're gone. Well, it turns out that these children have been munchy little snacks for this big demon that was down in this well, okay? Ashley kept hearing things like, I'm hungry, I'm starving, something like that. She kept hearing that. Look at this guy, man. Look at it's like Joey Super Cool Food Reviews, right? Just munching. Just munching. The cool thing is that whenever Ashley goes into, like, exorcist mode, at least prior to this, it always cut to, like, a cave. And now we realize why that is. It's because down in this well, this is where this demon was. And he's revealing to her her various faces. Uh, they kind of get into some big, heated conversation. And uh, Ashley eventually has to do battle with this demonic force. Um, and I guess we get a little bit of backstory regarding this demon. But per usual, a great Mike Mignola team. Uh, Cameron Stewart doing the story. Chris Robertson, uh, I believe, is doing the story as well. And then we have Mike Norton doing the artwork and, as always, Dave Stewart doing the coloring. So just another solid BPRD story. Now, this is a new book. I believe it's going to be a miniseries, but it's called Weird Detective. I decided to pick it up, also by Dark Horse. It's over 50 pages, bro. It's a double size issue written by oh, Van Viente, Fred Van Lente, artwork by Gio Villanova. Um, I'm not familiar with them, but I guess this guy, the writer, uh, let me give you a, a, a hint of, or a sample of his pedigree, if I could pull up the article, and let me give credit to the article that, uh, talks about, it. this is from Nothing But Comics, um, they say that this guy, Fred Van Lente, is a prolific comics lifer, having written everything from titles and series like Action Philosophers, Marvel Zombies, Archer and Armstrong, Cowboys and Aliens, Conan the Avenger, Power Man and Iron Fist, Magnus Robot Fighter, The Amazing Spider-Man, Ivar, Time Walker, and even a biographical play about Jack Kirby. And I guess he has an extensive knowledge of world history... He has a knack for finding humor in the bizarre and complex with an extensive knowledge of world history and academia. So pretty cool. They're saying that this is kind of like an oddball humor type story with a lot of H.P. Lovecraft elements in here. So the detective, his name is Sebastian Green. He's a veteran NYPD cop who uh, has been going, going through some changes and so through these changes, he's, I guess, risen up the ranks and has become a top cop, a top detective in the NYPD. But he also has some peculiarities about him. And what's funny is, is that the peculiarities, <laughs> he attributes them to being from Canada. Yeah, 
whatever that means, because I've met a ton of Canadians. I watch Canadians. I don't know. I've never attributed anyone being weird because they're Canadian. But there are weirdos everywhere, right? Um, so I'm looking forward to this. I'm looking forward to this. I don't know much else about the story. I didn't want to really spoil it for myself. But when you see a guy getting sucked into the toilet such as this, right, it kind of perks my interest a little bit, you know? I'm kind of like, hey, what the hell is going on here? I mean, is this going to affect me like Jaws did going in the water? Uh, you know, am I going to be afraid to take a number two after I read this or what? But uh, I was intrigued, and of course, you know, we got Pentagons. Pentagrams, rather, and, you know, stuff. So I figure I'll give it a shot, and I'll let you guys know how it goes, and maybe it'll be like a keep or sleep kind of thing. I'm going to th thinking about revitalizing that segment of the show, you know, keep or sleep, where I decide whether or not I keep a book or not. All right, on to Image Comics. We got Descender, number 12. This is the first issue of the third story arc. Um, we have Tim 22 on the cover here, and he's kind of like the doppelganger of Tim 21, everybody's lovable robot in this series. Um, Tim 21 is still on the homeworld uh, of the robot resistance, which is known as what, the hardwire. Um, in the last issue, number 11, we know that Tim 22 began to attack Tim 21. Uh, they want what's inside of Tim 21's brain, man. He, he supposedly may have some information in his head regarding the location of all the dead robots that have perished in this war. You see, a long time ago, these gigantic robots came down, came from out of nowhere, known as harvesters. And they began eliminating human beings of the, oh my god, what is it called? The United Galactic Council. So after that happened, humans and other races in the galaxy, they're like, screw this, we can't have any more robots around anymore. And they, you know, started to commit genocide against the robots. So now you have this big uh, battle between humankind and robot kind, but then there's also a race of uh, individuals known as the in-betweeners that are kind of like cyborgs. It's a very rich, very rich uh, story. But also what we get in this as well is we learn the background of Tim 22. Um, and he was abused. He um, was a servant boy for this real cantankerous, grouchy old man who, look, abused him with a cane, burned a freaking cigarette on his cheek. You know, just horrible things. Horrible things. And it may explain why Tim 22 uh, is the way he is. You know, why he's kind of a bit paranoid. Why he kind of maybe has some issues emotionally. You know, much like if, if a human being gets abused and they go through trauma, especially repeated trauma, you know, they may have some issues later on in life. You know, PTSD issues, certainly, or other various ailments. So, I don't know if this is going to make me feel a bit more empathy for Tim 22, because I do love Tim 21, uh, but we'll have to see. But again, Jeff Lemire has a great knack of writing tremendous dialogue. Um, Dustin Gwynn great artwork man it's just kind of like a unique watercolors kind of look almost minimalistic in a way uh but really really draws you in and i love this book and like almost all image books my only major complaint is is that they're just so short you know they're just so short but i'm really kind of all in on this series so i'm looking forward to it do yourself a favor Check out Descender, man. It's only up to issue number 12. Buy those first trade books online, man, and you can get caught up for under 20 bucks. All right, and then we finally have Beauty, number 8. We got Jason Hahn 
Uh, Hurley, I can't remember his name. La, 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 la. Jeremy Hahn, sorry, and Jason Hurley. All right, I mixed it up. But we have a new artist in this, Brett Weldy. And what they've promised is a series of one-shots as a prequel to the whole beauty, uh, which is the STD that people wanted to catch because it makes people beautiful in a carbon copy cookie cutter way but there are some devastating side effects to it i don't know much about what's going on in this story because i couldn't find much about it um but it looks like it has to do with a young lady something with a hit man in it not quite as violent as the other issue which i really really enjoyed which was kind of about um a uh, Hispanic guy that was kind of like an enforcer for some kind of drug cartel. But it was a great book. But I'm sorry, I don't know too much about it. But do yourself a favor, man. Get the first Beauty Trade. Uh, collects issues one through six. It's a great story, man. It's great social commentary. Very unique, you know, and it really explores vanity. It explores greed of corporations. For instance, uh, there was a cure that was developed, but the corporations are kind of holding that back. You know? Get you thinking, right? Get you thinking. All right, guys, that's been another Hump Day haul. I'm sorry I didn't know everything about all my books, but sometimes that happens. Let me select a cover of the week. Let me see here. And the cover of the week is going to be... I don't know, I'm just feeling this hell on earth, Ashley Strode, man. It's just creepy, those poor kids. Souls trapped. Yeah. All right, dudes. Oh, and by the way, there's going to be a big power reveal for Ashley Strode in this issue that may have ramifications for the end of this whole series. So you may want to check this out. Okay, dudes. All right, you guys have a nice week. Bye! Where's the...